When we set out to learn something, we typically have a goal in mind. Maybe to do well on an important exam. Maybe to master a new technology that will help us get a better job. Or maybe to shoot better scores on the golf course. But whatever it is, we want to learn in such a way that we will be able to perform well later when it really counts, not just during instruction and practice. But judging during instruction and practice whether we are actually achieving that goal is no easy task. Most of us have had the experience of thinking we were well prepared for an exam only to discover during the exam that we were drawing a lot of blanks. Or maybe an experience like I had after completing my training to be an AYSO soccer referee at my first game. We're all out on the field, parents lined up along the sidelines, and I realize I can't remember how to start the game. <laughs> One reason we can misjudge during instruction and practice whether we are actually learning has to do with an important distinction, the distinction between learning and practice. It is natural to assume that how well we are performing during instruction and practice is a good indicator of how well we are learning. But that is far from true. Indeed, conditions of instruction and practice that improve performance rapidly, making us think we are learning quickly and easily, often fail to support actual learning. Whereas other conditions of instruction and practice, ones that create difficulties for us, may even seem to be slowing our rate of learning, can actually optimize our learning and allow us to perform well later when it really counts. We've come to call such difficulties desirable difficulties. They're difficulties because they create challenges and they slow the apparent rate of learning. They're desirable because they enhance our ability to perform later when it really matters. There's four such difficulties we want to discuss with you today. The first is varying the conditions of practice rather than keeping them constant and predictable. One thing we can vary is where we choose to study. In research carried out years ago when we were at the University of Michigan, there were two groups of students. Each group of students studied a long list of words and then three hours later restudied the words. What differed between the groups, as shown on the screen, is whether they came back to the same place to restudy the words or to a new place on the Michigan campus. Then, three hours later, they were brought to a new location on the campus and asked to recall the words. As you can see, the group that studied the words in two different locations remembered significantly more words than did the students who studied the words in the same place both times. Now, some of you, I'm sure, have noticed that these results run counter to what's pretty standard advice to students, which is to find one good place to study and then do all of one's studying in that place. Another thing we can vary is what we choose to practice. In one of the earliest studies on this topic, children practiced throwing miniature bean bags at a four by four inch target on the floor. For one group of children, the target was always four feet away. For another group of children, it was sometimes three feet away, sometimes five feet away, but never four feet away. Then, later, both groups of children were brought back and tested at the four foot distance. The children who practiced at three feet and five feet but never four feet were more accurate at the four foot distance than were the children who did all their practice at that distance. This though has now actually spread to how people practice as a trip to any golf diving range will quickly show you. People practice the same shot over and over again. Same things in other skills, such as shooting free throws over and over again from the standard 15-foot distance. I should tell a little story here. 
When Shaquille O'Neal was playing for the LA Lakers and having trouble making free throws, leading to the so-called hack-a-shack defense, Bob was quoted in Time Magazine as suggesting that perhaps Shaq should try shooting free throws from, 14, from, a, from a mixture of 14 feet and 16 feet rather than always from the 15-foot free throw line. But as far as we could tell, that advice was never taken. <laughs> a second desirable difficulty is spacing out the time between repeated study sessions. When we study something once and then study it again, it matters a great deal when it is restudied. If we delay or space the restudying episode, that actually produces much better recall than does studying the material right away again. But what about cramming a study technique near and dear to many of us who survive college by cramming the night before, maybe the entire night before, important exams. The truth is that cramming can work, but only on a test administered right after cramming. If there's something we really want to learn, we should not cram because it's followed by dramatic forgetting. So cramming is a very bad idea. The third desirable difficulty we want to share with you today is to practice retrieving what we are trying to learn rather than restudying it or reviewing it. The act of retrieving is a very powerful learning event, much more powerful than is restudying. Every time we retrieve information after a delay, we modify our memory for that information in a way that makes it much more recallable in the future, say, on a test or on the job. So, rather than restudying or reviewing, we should practice taking, uh, take practice quizzes, uh, answer questions at the back of chapters, or explain what we are trying to learn to someone else. Our motto should be retrieve or output more Restudy or input less. And finally, another benefit of testing ourselves one way or another is that the more we practice retrieving what we will be tested on later, the more we seem to lower our test anxiety, which can also help us to perform later on an actual test or on the job. That point leads me to recount the day, a lot of years ago, I was on a plane watching the flight attendant demonstrate how to put on inflatable life vest. I thought, how many times have I seen this? 50 times? 100 times? But something made me think, do I know how to do this? So I closed my eyes. I imagined the plane was down in the water. Some people were screaming. There was a faint smell of smoke. I began to get nervous and sweaty. Where's the life vest? Under the seat, but like how under the seat? In like a Velcro bag? Anyway, I managed to get it out. I held it up. What's the front? What's the back? I slipped it over my head. Then what? Then what? Come on. Some people are yanking some. <laughs> I can only hope I'm not stuck on the plane behind some of you. <clears throat> anyway, I imagine that I inflated the vest, got to the exit window, only to find out I wasn't supposed to inflate the vest till I got out of the window. <laughs> now, some years later, I was invited to talk at the air traffic control in Oklahoma City. I suggested that there should be one place in the airport where you could actually go and put on a face mask and put on a life vest, that one time of actually doing it would be worth more than dozens of passive observations. I even suggested that after that exercise, you could get a little lapel pin that said, follow me, I know how to get out of the plane. <laughs> <laughs> the final desirable difficulty we wanna share with you today is probably the most counterintuitive study technique interleaving 
our study or practice. Perhaps the best way to describe or to explain interleaving is to contrast it to the study technique that most of us use, blocking. Blocking is studying the same topic or practicing the same skill over and over and over again until we feel we've mastered it and then moving on to the next topic or skill. But when we interleave, we mix together or alternate our study and practice of the several things that we are trying to learn. And a variety of research findings have shown that such interleave practice can optimize our performance later, and often when it matters the most. Consider, for example, a study involving a varsity baseball team in California. Half of the players were given extra batting practice in which they tried to hit fastballs, curveballs, and change-ups in a randomly interleaved fashion while the other players were given the same number of pitches of each type, but in a blocked manner. Not surprisingly, players getting blocked practice made more solid hits during practice, making it look like they were learning better. But on a test some weeks later, it was the players who had gotten interleave practice who made more solid hits particularly when thrown interleave pitches, which is, of course, what would happen in a real game. These kinds of benefits of interleaving have now been shown for a variety of motor skills, and importantly, they've all been, also been shown for our learning of conceptual skills, such as mathematics. In one study, for example, students learned how to calculate the volumes of different kinds of solids, like cones and cylinders, either by practicing problems in an interleaved manner or in a blocked manner. As you can see, during practice, it again appears that blocking is, a, is producing the better learning. But on a week, test several weeks later, there was a dramatic advantage for interleaved practice, in fact, a three times greater advantage. What makes these kinds of results of particular importance is that they call into question the way that problems are assigned in the typical workbooks used in math instruction, where problems of the same type are usually grouped together. This page is a good example. As you can see, the student is told that all of these problems are to be solved by applying the Pythagorean theorem. In essence, the assignment gives the student a kind of crutch. But on a later high stakes test, no such crutch will be provided. We entitled this talk, How to Study If You Really Want to Learn. We obviously thought that was a good title, but it is a bad title in one respect, namely, that the word study may imply that what we've had to say applies only or mostly to students. In fact, knowing how to learn is the ultimate survival tool, not just during the years of formal education, but across our lifetimes. In our ever more complex and rapidly changing world, we need to acquire new skills. We need to update old skills, not just in our jobs, but as we pursue hobbies and develop new interests, or maybe just want to help our children or grandchildren learn. The good news is we all have an incredible capacity to learn. The key, though, to realizing that capacity is to be suspicious of the sense of ease and undeterred by the sense of difficulty. In short, we need to make things hard on ourselves, but in good ways. We need to vary. Space. Retrieve. And interleave. Thank you. Thank you.